Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at some sample problems. And to start off, I thought I'd just show this graphic. I was looking for sample problems and I found this, this nice graphic here. And I thought we could go through that. At the, it's a skier at the top of the hill. And, and again, this isn't a sample problem. This is just a graphic kind of get you thinking about um, work and energy. So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward thing, I, I hope. Um, the person is stationary to start. Uh, the person has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. Uh, it just says PE, but this is, is more accurately, according to our notation, PE sub G. And then as the, as the person goes down the slope, their, their height above the reference line, so this is the, the dashed line, here, uh, where the potential energy is zero. And we, um, we see that as they get to this point, now they have less gravitational potential energy, now they have kinetic energy, but the total is still 50,000. Uh, they get down to point C here, and then these are the values that go with that. So now it's even more kinetic energy, even less um, gravitational potential. They go up a ramp and they fly up into the air. Uh, when they're at the peak, they still have kinetic energy. They're still moving to the right. This was similar to one of the examples we did in yesterday's lesson. So uh, the V sub Y is zero, but V sub X is certainly not zero. Person's still moving to the right, so that's why they still have kinetic energy. Um, again, the total is 50,000, just like at the start. And so if the total keeps being 50,000, we are clued in to the fact that this is a frictionless example, air resistance and friction are neglected, okay? And obviously that's not realistic, but it is a simplification that we can make in some problems to, to make the problems simpler, uh, easier to work with. Uh, we can add in friction, in, you know, we can have friction in problems and, you know, then it's a little bit harder and takes more time. Uh, so it's, it's good to look at problems both ways. And then you can also notice that at points B and D, even though the skier was doing much different things, here they're at B, they're going downhill and they're touching the slope. And at D, they're up in the air, they're at their peak, not touching anything except the air, that the conditions as far as energy are exactly the same. A uh, person then descends to the ground, getting faster and faster and faster and faster. Um, and then this is the moment just before impact Okay, if you look really closely, the skier, uh, the skis are not touching the ground. So it's that instant just before impact and that you should be familiar with back from chapter three when we would look at the, the velocity of a golf ball just before it hit the ground or something like that. Um, so anyway, all of the energy is now kinetic energy and zero gravitational potential energy. All right, now we're gonna look at this example of a box sitting up against a compressed spring. We're given the mass of the box and we're told how much the spring is compressed. And it says the box is released and slides up a ramp to a height of 0 0.70 meters. And we're neglecting friction and drag in this problem as well. So the first question is just how much elastic potential energy or that's synonymous with spring potential energy was stored. So if we look on our equation sheet, we see that spring potential energy is one half K delta X squared. And so that's equal to one half times, let's see, we don't know K. Ah, so this is a different, <laughs> ah, I did not realize this is a different problem than I, than I thought it was gonna be. Um, so we need a different approach. So that's not gonna work. And this is similar to, to how a student would uh, often view this problem. They might think, oh, this is gonna be easy. We just do this. And then we realize that there's, there's more to it. Um, so what we need to do is we need to say, okay, well that doesn't work. 
So let's look at our diagram here and let's see if I can just move this. Yeah, sorry, you probably weren't seeing what I was doing, but I was moving one of the control panels. So if we look at our diagram, we call this our initial right here. And then it goes up the ramp to a certain place. And we call that final. So this is right here, draw our dashed line for PEG equals zero. And then we'll, well, not a dashed line, but we'll draw a regular line. And then it's a very small diagram, which was intentional. I was trying to leave room so that we could do the work on here. Um, no pun intended. The 0 0.7 meters, that's the height that we are given here. And I think that's all we really need on our diagram. So those are the first four steps. If you look in your packet for this unit, uh, the, the problem solving steps are listed there. Problem one, draw a sketch, um, or I'm sorry, step one, draw a sketch. Step two, label the initial state and um, Step two, label the final state. Step three, label this PEG equals zero. So there are a lot of steps in there, but, but you see we just did four steps in a very short amount of time. And now we really wanna think about the, the initial state and the final state more. So at the initial state, the velocity is, let's see, it's held against a spring, so that's zero. And we know that the height is zero because we picked it to be. Okay, we pick that to be the place where the height zero. And we know that this, oh, I hate it when it does that. The height final is 0 0.7 meters. And the velocity final is zero because it that's how high it went. So it slid up to that height. Um, so if it, if it still had a velocity, it would have kept going upward, but that's how high it went. Uh, the spring, Delta X for the spring final is equal to zero. The spring's not compressed at all at the end. At the beginning, the spring is 0 0.10 meters. Okay. And so I'm actually going to just, just, we'll just cross this out. We'll do this problem on another slide. All right. So now we think about, okay, what are the forces that are acting? And so we think about free body diagrams. So we have this time where the spring is pushing on it. There's a normal force. So we're talking about this part right here. It's, it's on the horizontal, the spring's pushing it to the right. Okay, it's right after we've let go. There's weight that's supposed to be straight down there. There's a spring force to the right. It's a capital F sub S, so that's spring force, as opposed to lowercase f sub S, which stands for static friction. Okay, just giving you a moment to think about that. All right, so we've got that. Uh, the only non-conservative force on here is the normal force. Remember spring and spring force and weight, those are the two um, most important um, conservative forces that you need to know for physics 111. They're the only two conservative forces you need to know for physics 111. And so if, if it's not spring force or gravity, then it's one of those other ones. After it leaves the spring, if it's still on the horizontal, then, then your free body diagram would look like this. We still have the normal force acting. As it goes up the ramp, it's gonna have a normal force at an angle. And the, the angle's gonna change, but essentially it's gonna be at some angle. But if we just think all the way through, we have to think about all the different forces that are acting all the way from I to F, and it doesn't matter how far apart I and F are, if we just think through all the forces. And it turns out normal force is the only force that's acting at any of those times and so then if we were to draw our work diagrams, well, these, these first two are gonna be the same, the normal force 
and the displacement are perpendicular to each other. Later on, when the normal force is at an angle, the normal force and displacement are still perpendicular to each other. And so the work by non-conservative forces is equal to zero. Again, notice my lowercase w's uh, versus my capital W's. I put these little hats on the capital W so that you can tell them apart. Maybe I should put capital W, uh, make that a capital W too. All right, so the, these are all part of those problem solving steps in your packet. And now we can write out our conservation of energy equation. This is on our equation sheet. And so we just take the time to write it out. And on your homework, quizzes, tests, I want you to start with the full version of it. I know, it takes a little bit of time, about 20 seconds to write this out. I will, if there's no springs in the problem, I'm okay if you just write down a five term version of it where you get rid of the spring terms right away, but this one does have a spring in it. So we'll go with the seven term version. Once we get this looking like this, now we want to start simplifying. And this is similar to what we were doing so far. Our, our analysis is really the same as what we were doing the last couple of days looking at those energy bar charts. It's, it's thinking about what the kinds of energy, what kinds of energy are present and which kinds aren't present. So in the initial state, we took the time to think about it. We said the initial velocity is zero, the initial height zero, and it does have a spring compressed. So that makes our, our life easy. There's, there's no gravitational potential energy there because of where we drew this line for gravitational potential energy. If we had drawn the line lower, let me just change colors here. If we had drawn the line lower right here, if we had done our gravitational potential energy line here, well then this term, this gravitational potential energy term initial would not be zero because there's some height there. How much height? I don't know. We're not given that. We could make something up. You know, if we said that was 0.1 meters, then this height would be 0.8 meters and the problem would still work just fine. However, it makes makes it harder on us so there's really no point to do that all right now i'm going to change back to red though i don't really like red uh that's just the default color and i always forget to change it all right so it has spring potential energy remember that spring is compressed it has no kinetic energy at the beginning because it's held okay that's the clue there it's held against the spring before it's released all right, we just said there was no work by non-conservative forces. At the end, it does have gravitational potential energy because it's at a height of 0 0.7 meters. It's not touching the spring and it's not moving. So our equation becomes pretty simply that the potential energy of the spring equals the gravitational potential energy final. And we were asked to find the spring potential energy or elastic energy. That's just another way to say that. And so normally I would fill in for this term, I would fill in one half K delta X squared, but that's not needed here. And so what we do is we do uh, fill in this side, which is MG H I. And so P E S I equals 0 0.25 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0 0.7 meters. Okay. And so now all we need to do is calculate that. That comes out to 1.715. And the units here if we just come over here and work out the units, we've got kilograms, we've got meters per second squared, and we've got meters. So we could make that meters squared. However, uh, this part right here, you should recognize as a Newton, and then we still got that meter. A Newton meter is a joule. So if we've done things right, all the 
times we do energy and work, it should come out the joules, but it is worth looking at it each time because sometimes we don't do it right. And so we can, if our units don't come out to the right units, then that indicates we've done something wrong somewhere. All right, now, um, take a moment to uh, just look at that. Okay, so we're gonna look at this problem now. Uh, problem three, that is. So it's a continuation of the same problem. And so we're supposed to figure out for a different mass box, that's the difference here. It's pushed against the spring the same amount. And then how high up the ramp is it gonna slide? Well, when we push it up against the spring, because the box has more mass, does it have more energy because it's a bigger box or a more massive box? So it might be, you might be inclined to say, yes, it has more energy. But then we go back and we think about the spring potential energy equation just in general. I'm not putting an I or an F here, just in general. It's equal to one half K delta X squared. And we see that's not a function of mass. So it doesn't matter what you put up against that spring in terms of its mass, whether it's a quarter of a kilogram or 20 kilograms or 100 kilograms or 0.5 kilograms, it has the same amount of energy stored up because it's the same spring and the spring is what determines the K. That's a, that's a property of the spring. It's a measure of how stiff the spring is. And then the delta X, that's how much we've compressed it. And the, the amount of compression is the same in this problem as it was in the original problem. And so the amount of energy stored up is the same, but then when we release it, how high is it going to go? Well, gravitational potential energy, we know that from initial to, to final, where it ends up over here, we know that that seven term equation is going to simplify down, just like in the last case. just be the gravitational potential energy. So we have the same value here, 1.715 joules equals mghf. But now we're going to be putting in a number here that's twice as big. And so this number, two times as big, this number is going to be one half as big. And if you can't see that, we can we can just solve it and, and find that. So 1.715 joules equals 0 0.50 kilograms times 9.8 and HF, HF, and we divide both sides. So divided by 0.5. comes out to 0 0.35 meters. Okay, so I actually plug those into my calculator to get an answer that I already knew. I knew it was going to be half as big and half of 0.7 is definitely 0 0.35. So another thing we can do that they they didn't ask for, but we could do is to calculate K. And K, again, is that measure of how stiff the spring is. And we have enough information to do it. And even though this problem didn't ask it, you know, certainly on a homework quiz or test in a problem like this, when you have enough information, they could ask it. So we can simply, um, just, we know that PES equals one half k delta x i squared. And so we already calculated this previously. We know, we know that this is 0 0.1 meters. Notice that since this delta x term for the spring, that's how much the spring is compressed or stretched. Since it's squared, 
it doesn't matter if, if the spring got stretched to the right or compressed to the left. Either way, it stores the same amount of energy. If you go 0.1 meters compressed, so pushing it to the left and making it smaller, or if you stretch it to the right, now you'd have to attach the box to that for that to make sense. But if we attach the box here, we pull it back this way, or, or pull it to the right, 0.1 meters, we've stored 1.715 joules of energy, just the same as if we compress it. And so it doesn't matter that the sign doesn't matter in here, uh, but it also means we can stretch or compress and get the same amount of energy storage. Um, so now it's just a matter of doing the, the algebra here. So two times 1.715 joules divided by 0 0.10 meters quantity squared. A lot of times students just like to put the squared right here on the meters and they think that's perfectly clear, but it's definitely not. You need to put parentheses because this squared refers to the units and the number. Keep track of that. And now we simply go to our calculator and plug in the numbers. We got 343. Now the units here, we've got joules per meter squared. And a joule is a newton meter. So newton meter per meter squared. And we can see that we get newtons per meter. And that's a that's the SI unit for the spring constant. We could simplify that. We could say it was kilogram meter per second squared per meter. And so we could have units for the spring constant of kilogram per second squared, but the this, this is a more logical unit because it takes a certain amount of force to compress or stretch the spring one meter. So it takes 343 newtons of force to get that spring to compress or stretch by one meter. And so this is actually a really, really lightweight spring a uh, spring that doesn't have, um, it's, it's not a very strong spring at all because 343 newtons is really not that much force and one meter of compression or stretching is, is a whole lot. Um, you wouldn't stretch it that much, but that's the ratio. All right, here we have a problem that I, I found and I copied and pasted in here. This problem is all symbolic, but we're going to put in some numbers here so that we can solve it numerically. Basically, a bobsled was, was going down a slope and it got to this point right here, P1. It got there and it was already going some velocity V1. So, so there's you know, some track that you can imagine coming down and getting to there. And so it was already moving and we'll give it some, we'll give it some speed. Go. Let's change to purple. All right. Ooh, let's say that our initial velocity here was 10 meters per second. And we're at some height, say 20 meters. All right. We're 20 meters above point P2. And we're supposed to find out how fast the bobsled was going. And I'm not going to give you any more information. Let's see if we can solve it with just that. So we look, we've, our initial is going to be right here um, at point P1, and our final is going to be down here at point P2. And so our first four steps is to draw a sketch. Well, you know, sometimes that's already done for us. Again, I'm referring to those steps in the packet that you got from the bookstore. Uh, draw the sketch. Step two, label initial. Step three, label final. Step four, label the place where the gravitational potential energy is zero, or we could also say h equals zero, because h is part of that. PEG is mgh. So where h is zero, then the gravitational potential energy is zero. So those are the first four steps. Now we think about um, drawing free body diagrams. And this I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because this was covered in the last problem. There is a normal force 
and there's weight and the normal force changes directions throughout the uh, scenario it changes in not just these two directions but lots and lots of different directions the normal force is always perpendicular to the slope however in the work diagram we can we can think about what a sample work diagram would look like again just quickly for some random place along there for any sliding object the normal force and the displacement are going to be perpendicular and that means the work by non-conservative forces is going to be zero all right so this is all part of our problem solving process now we go to that seven term equation that's found on your equation sheet and I want you to write out the whole thing except I will if there are no springs present certainly I authorize you to skip those terms and that is the case here there are no springs so I'm just going to simplify immediately to the five term version and we're going to figure out what is going on here we know there's no work by non-conservative forces because we looked at the free body diagrams and we looked at the work diagrams and we should according to the problem solving steps we should circle on our free body diagrams we should circle the non-conservative forces and that's not an essential step but the reason i put that in there is to just draw your attention to the fact that we need to think about which forces are conservative like weight and spring and which forces are non-conservative and for all the non-conservative forces we need to draw a work diagram to know whether we have any work and if there is work then we're going to need to compute it and put it in here or put the equation in here we can substitute in fd cosine theta if we uh, don't know some of the values all right what else is there anything else that's going to be zero well let's look gravitational potential energy initially um no it's, it's going to be in there because this this z is really what we could think of as h sub i and kinetic energy that's not going to be zero because it's moving at 10 meters per second uh, gravitational potential energy at the end oh that is zero because the bobsled is right on that line and so that's going to be zero and kinetic energy at the end well no it's not going to be zero that's what we're finding if you go down you're going 10 meters per second and get to the bottom of the hill you should be going even faster and so that should not be zero so here we were able to simplify our seven term equation down to three and now we can put in mg h i plus um, one half m v i squared and right about now you're probably wondering hey look professor barber forgot to give us the mass i substitute all those in all these definitions for gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy are found on your equation sheet. In fact, the whole seven term equation is written on your equation sheet in this format. And if you like writing down that version, it does take a little bit longer, but it, for some people it allows them more easily to cross out the terms if you have the, the definitions of each kind of, kind of energy in there. Uh, but in any case, we get to here and I say we don't need the mass I can divide through the whole equation by mass which is the same as saying I'm multiplying by 1 over m and so then it cancels out of every single term and so I don't need it now note that the spring potential energy you look over here there's no mass in there and so if you have that term you're not going to be dividing out the mass and if you have the work term, you may or may not be able to. Sometimes we can get the mass to be a part of that. If we have an expression for it, we can get the mass to be a part of that. All right, so now what are we supposed to find? Final velocity. So 9.8 meters per second squared times uh, 20 meters height plus 1 half times 10 meters per second parentheses put your squared outside the parentheses equals one half times v sub f squared 
And so we're going to multiply both sides by 2, and then we're going to take the square root. Now let's make that a bracket. 9.8 times 20 plus 1 half times 10. All right, and that's equal to VF, and we could say, oh, that's plus or minus, but really here we're finding the speed. We're not finding the velocity. The equation gives us the speed. We can look at the diagram and we can know what direction it is, uh, but the equation is not meant to give us the velocity. It's simply meant to give us the speed. I know that seems weird because it has the symbol V, but V without a vector hat is the speed. And so now, give me a moment, I'll put all this into my calculator. You can do the same and check if I'm doing this right. It's not a problem I did ahead of time, and so it's possible. I could make a mistake here. So what I got was 22.2. And if we look through at the units, uh, we have meter squared per second squared and meter squared per second squared. And then we take the square root of that and we get meters per second. So I can't guarantee it's the right answer, but the units make sense. And the value of it makes sense. It's not ridiculously fast, but it is faster than how than the speed it was going at point one. And so that's a good thing. Now we'll look at the same problem, but we're going to look at when they went up and they they did the same thing again, and they were they were going along. And they got to this point and they were going at 10 meters per second and they were at a height of 20 meters um, but the only difference is now the snow condition is less than perfect and there is a place right here where there's some friction that's not negligible so we have to consider it and we'll say that the coefficient of kinetic friction for this for this region here is equal to 0 0.2 sure um, I don't know how much difference that's going to make I guess it depends how long we make this stretch we'll make it a we'll make it a sizable stretch we'll say it's Fifteen meters, fifteen meters long. So the drawing's not to scale. All right, so fifteen meters, and then again we want to find, we want to find v two. Okay, so in our analysis, everything's going to be. Um, the same for all the other parts, but now this part is different. So let's draw a free body diagram for that part. Normal force is there, weight is there, but now we have kinetic friction. And we circle the non-conservative forces. We've already talked about how the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement, but let's draw a work diagram for the friction force. Step one for drawing a work diagram, draw the force. Step two, draw the displacement, making sure they're tail to tail. Okay, the force is acting to the left. The skier is moving to the right while that force is acting. Step three, label the angle between them, 180 degrees. And so then our work by non-conservative forces. I mean, it's the work done by friction specifically, but since that's the only non-conservative force that's doing any work, we can look at it and we can say that's equal to Fd cosine theta. And we can further say that the force is friction. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe come back up here. We know that friction Kinetic friction is the easy one. It's just equal to mu k times fn. And 
we can sum forces in the y direction for that free body diagram there. And this is one of those nice easy cases where the normal force is entirely in the positive y direction, weights entirely in the negative y direction, and there's no acceleration in the y direction. So the normal force is equal to mg. And so friction is equal to mu k times mg. So I was substituting this in here. And now I can substitute this in here. So I get mu k mg d cosine theta, or I can call it 180 degrees. Sorry about these random horizontal lines. I have yet to figure out exactly what's causing that. There's a button on my pen and I'm not entirely sure if it's when I hit the button on the pen or something else. Maybe just some glitch with the equipment I'm using. In any case, this is not meant to be crossed out. And we can go back to our equation that we had previously. Everything's the same except we're going to keep that work term. I'm going to go ahead and fill in all of those. I'm going to start right here at this line. So uh, m g h i plus one half. I'm almost certain I didn't hit the button that time. M v i squared plus work. I'll just put it as the symbol first. Equals. Uh, what do we have at the end? Just one half m v f squared. So now I can take this expression and put it in here. So I get m g h i plus one half m v i squared plus mu k m g d cosine 180 equals one half m v f squared. And again, I did not have the mass given to me for the, the bobsled. Um, so I can divide through because it's in every single term. It's one of the common mistakes that students make is they'll cross out the mass in two terms or three terms and then in the fourth one they're just like oh whatever and like they just don't realize that algebraically that doesn't work. It only You can only divide out the mass if, you, if it's in every single term that's there and this time the work term did have the mass as part of it and so that worked out and so now it's just a matter of substituting in values and I'm doing you know a little, little tiny bit of algebra and substitution and calculator work. So let's see, let's not start with that. Let's just go ahead to the final expression. I'm gonna skip steps here in, just because there's only so much room left on my, my paper here. So two, this is gonna be the square root, and then two times uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, and this should be a bracket, I think, to be more clear, times 20 meters plus one half times 10 meters per second squared, really long expression here, plus 0 0.2 times D. Now there's nothing called D up here, but D is the displacement. And so that is how far that friction force was acting. Okay, going back to our work diagram, the friction force was acting to the left while the bobsled went to the right for 15 meters. And then, let's see. Oh, and I left out the G. That's easy to do. For some reason in this work term, there's one, two, three, four, five things. It's easy to miss one. I almost missed one. I skipped over it, came back to it. All right, and so oh, I need to end my bracket. 
there we go. So it looks like, oh, wait a minute. Why is this gonna make the velocity greater? Now we have a, we have a plus sign here. So our velocity before, I'm sorry, our speed before was 22.2 meters per second. And now it's like, hey, everything's the same. So if we're adding this term, isn't that going to make the speed greater than before? And that doesn't make any sense. Well, that wouldn't make any sense for the speed to be greater. But if we look more closely here, we see cosine of 180, which is negative 1. And so this term is going to be negative. And so it should end up having a smaller value for our v sub f. All right. And now it's going to take a little bit longer, but we'll... Go ahead and plug in these values. And I get a value of 20.8. And so it is a little bit less. It's not a lot less. I wasn't sure. Didn't do it ahead of time. So could have could have made this coefficient of friction a little bit higher or made this a little bit longer um, but it does make it 1.4 meters per second lower than it was in the other case <laughs>